Hello, everybody. I'm going to talk about um, systemic treatment for breast cancer. Uh, Dr. Lazarus will talk about the surgery part, and I'm going to talk about the chemo and targeted agents part. Um, so this is in the case we call adjuvant treatment. Adjuvant chemotherapy means prevent it from coming back. The other word, vocabulary word, is in the metastatic setting, means if, it's come, if breast cancer comes outside the breast, how do we treat it best? But tonight we're going to be talking, I'm going to talk mostly about adjuvant, means preventing breast cancer from coming back after it's already been um, excised. Let me see. And this is the, the take home message from this slide um, is going to be part of the take home message is that before the 1960s, really there wasn't a lot. Um, that was offered for systemic therapy for breast cancer. Um, between the 1940s and the 1960s, we sort of started noticing that women who were premenopausal and whose um, ovaries were functioning, they were producing estrogen, didn't do as well from a breast cancer standpoint as women who, who don't have ovaries, who are not producing estrogen. Um, in 1974, doxorubicin is one of our chemotherapies we use in a lot of different types of cancer, um, was approved for, um, for advanced breast cancer or metastatic breast cancer. Um, in 1977, tamoxifen, which is an anti-estrogen therapy, again goes back to that ovarian um, function aspect of it, um, was approved um, in the advanced setting. And then in 1984, we found out that we could use it effectively in the adjuvant setting to prevent breast cancer from coming back after it's already been cut out. And this is a theme in breast cancer and lots of different types of cancer is that um, we, we get approval of drugs in the metastatic setting um, and then we get approve, approval for drugs in the adjuvant setting. Um, in 1994, another chemotherapy was approved, first for advanced and then for in the adjuvant setting called paclitaxel. That's another one of our um, big chemotherapies for breast cancer. Um, in 1998, Herceptin, um, which I'll go back through what Herceptin is and what some of these other therapies are, but this was another targeted agent that was approved for treatment of breast cancer. And then in 2006, in the adjuvant setting. Okay. Um, in the early 2000s, um, science, we sort of as a research community um, started to discover that we can use genetic testing, so looking at genes expressed in particular tumors to help guide therapy. Um, how angry do tumors look from a genetic perspective? Um, and um, then in 2004, we got a, we have approved another anti-estrogen therapy, aromatase inhibitors, and I'll go back through what those are, but that's more. In 2012, we got an addition to Herceptin, which is Progetta, I'll go back through that. And then we have a couple of other targeted agents in 2013 and 2015. These are um, both still used in the metastatic setting. It's possible that we could use these in the adjuvant setting, um, but for now, these are used in the metastatic setting. As we notice the trend, breast cancer, a lot of things are approved in the metastatic setting before they're approved in the adjuvant setting. Um, so when Dr. Lazarus and I talk to each other about a woman's breast cancer, we want a blueprint of what's going on. And one of the most important things that we talk to each other about is the stage. Um, Breast cancer, like every cancer, comes in four stages. Stage four means not curable, metastatic, um, and everything before then means we're treating you for a cure. Stage one, small tumor, no lymph nodes are involved. And Dr. Lazarus will talk more about lymph nodes. Um, stage two and three breast cancers um, means that um, regional lymph nodes are involved, so lymph nodes just in the area. Um, the other thing that we may talk to each other about is grade. The grade of the tumor means how busy is it. Um, does the tumor, do the tumor cells look like they're dividing slowly under the microscope or do they look like they're dividing very quickly? Um, and then the last thing that we talked about that was sort of brought up on the first slide is genetics. Um, and this is the exciting part about being a breast oncologist um, in that um, we have targeted agents for breast cancer. We sort of already um, started talking about tamoxifen and Herceptin. Um, so for now, um, three genetically expressed markers are um, commonly used to treat breast cancer, the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, um, and the HER2 uh, receptor. And 
um, breast cancers can have just the estrogen receptor expressed. You can have just progesterone. You can have just, uh, or you can have just estrogen. Um, it's rarely just progesterone, but you can have just estrogen, can have just HER2, can have all three, or can have none. When you have all three, we say you're triple positive, one, two, three. And if you have none, we say you're triple negative. Um, obviously, um, when you talk about a tumor, there are more than three genes. There's more than ER and PR and HER2 going on. And um, what's um, been a field of a lot of excitement lately is mapping out the genetic complexities of breast tumors. This is an example of a PAN50, um, which in, rather than looking at just three genes, they've got 50 genes lined up here that they're looking at. So you can see all there's 50 that they're looking at um, here. And um, in a heat map, the, the red part means overexpressed and the green part means underexpressed. So some tumors look genetically like each other and some tumors don't. Um, but there's definitely more than ER and PR and HER2. The goal of, uh, of breast cancer treatment moving forward is to target as many of these genes as we can with as smart of drugs as possible to avoid the toxicities of chemotherapy. Um, so, let's see. So I'm going to talk first a little bit about targeting estrogen and progesterone receptors. Um, and another example of using genetics is when a woman comes to my clinic and has estrogen and progesterone receptor positive breast cancer, it's now a question, does she need chemotherapy? Do we even need chemotherapy? And we can use an Oncotype DX, which is a, com it's a commercially available assay, which looks at 21 genes. I just showed you 50 genes, but this particular assay looks at 21 genes within a woman's tumor. Um, typically, we use it when there is no lymph node involvement, but we can also use it when there's lymph node involvement. And uh, the assay takes and looks at those 21 genes. How angry does the breast cancer look? And it spits out a score between um, zero and 100. The closer you are to 100, the higher risk the situation is. Um, and um, what we actually, here's an example of, um, of an Oncotype recurrence score that I might get back. In this particular case, you can see there's a low risk Re recurrence risk of four puts you into the low risk. There's also intermediate risk and high risk. Um, but in the low risk situation, you don't need chemotherapy. In fact, it does you more harm than good if you're a low risk estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And this is huge um, because just 10 years, not even 10 years ago, um, if you had a three centimeter breast cancer, you had to get chemotherapy. Three centimeters, you gotta get chemotherapy. We're, get, we're smarter than that now, and we can use this assay. It's nice. Um, okay. So then um, the agents that we use to treat estrogen, progesterone, receptor, positive breast cancer, let's say you don't need chemotherapy. Um, these are both given for at least five years, and the two types that we use in the adjuvant setting are tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors. Um, tamox the way that the estrogen receptor works is that um, grabs estrogen circulating from, from outside the tumor and comes in and um, sits on DNA within the nucleus of the cell and, and allows for cell replication, proliferation of proteins, and what tamoxifen does is um, prevents the estrogen receptor and estrogen from sitting down on DNA and allowing for, for replication. That's the way that one works. The way aromatase inhibitors work, which were developed a little bit later, is to prevent estrogen from being made um, in the peripheral tissues level of the adrenal glands by inhibiting this enzyme called ar um, aromatase, which converts testosterone and other pre-estrogens into estrogen, so it prevents estrogen from ever being made. So two slightly different uh, mechanisms of action. The aromatase inhibitors are, work, uh, are used mostly in postmenopausal women, or you, you must be postmenopausal. Use of aromatase inhibitors assumes that your ovaries aren't working. Um, and the um, question is, 
um, how much more benefit, if any, would you get from aromatase inhibitors? A lot of my patients have. And um, this is an analysis of some data that we have that says that in postmenopausal women, these aromatase inhibitors work a little bit better than tamoxifen. Um, so on the y-axis there, you have recurrence, percent of patients who had a recurrence, and then on the x-axis, you have years. So you can see that after five um, years of tamoxifen versus five years of an aromatase inhibitor, postmenopausal menopausal women, t at 10 years, um, only 19% of women had a recurrence on the aromatase inhibitor versus 22.7% on tamoxifen. So not a huge benefit, but enough to where in, in women who are at that stage of life, I choose aromatase inhibitors first for ER positive breast cancer. So there's other side effects, and we can talk more about that um, if, if you like. Um, the other question that we talk about all day long in my clinic, I feel like, is when can I come off of this medicine? So I said five years is the minimum. A hot topic in breast cancer right now is do I need 10 years? Um, and there's some data that 10 years is a hair better than five years. Um, this on the um, left there are data from the ATLAS trial, which looked at tamoxifen for 10 years versus five years. And on the, on the y-axis, uh, you see um, recurrence risk, and on the x-axis you see years, and in the red are people who stopped uh, tamoxifen after five years, and in the blue are people who continued tamoxifen for 10 years, and at 15 years you got about a 4% advantage in terms of breast cancer free survival um, if you use tamoxifen for 10 versus five years, so 4%. So not a huge difference, but enough, um, enough to interest us. And then the other one on the on the right, this one's a little harder to understand, but just this year at ASCO, um, our national conference, um, they asked the question about 10 years of an aromatase inhibitor. This trial was of tamoxifen, this one's of the aromatase inhibitors, and they found a small benefit with the aromatase inhibitors, about 4% also put those if you continue for 10 years versus stopping at five years. In my clinic, what we do, because a, um, a lot of people are re ready to celebrate after being on this therapy for five years, so what we look at together is um, how risky their breast cancer looked at first. Did they have lymph nodes involved? Um, and did how angry did the tumor look at, from the beginning to decide if we should do five or 10 years? And there's also getting back to the genetics part we're developing genetics assays. One of them is called the Breast Cancer Index that I wrote right there that helps give us a score of how risky you may or may not be um, in terms of breast cancer coming back. But five versus 10 years is a, is a, is, remains a topic of, um, of discussion. Do you guys have questions about estrogen and progesterone, about the estrogen and progesterone receptor part of breast cancer? I'll keep going. Yes, ma'am. Um, first of all, I'm a 29 year breast cancer survivor. I did not have to have chemo. I didn't have any lymph node involvement. But they never suggested that I go on tamoxifen or, how do you say it, amyl? But An aromatase inhibitor. I mean, at 29 year survival rate, do you suggest that I do? No, I don't think so. I think you're cured. <laughs> But you were diagnosed when, during some of my timeline parts of your 29 years ago, 1987. 1987. So I don't, they didn't have the aromatase inhibitors then. And tamoxifen, I think, was the, the metastatic setting then. So you, congrats. <laughs> Yeah, the side, she asked, what are the side effects of tamoxifen? So for um, tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor, you're messing with your estrogen, um, either decreasing the production or altering the way it's um, uh, metabolized in cells. And a lot of women miss their estrogen. And the way that that's manifested, hot flashes, vaginal dryness, mood swings, sometimes your weight can change. Uh, with tamoxifen, there is a small risk. <laughs> Not statistically significant. <laughs> yeah, depends. Depends on the person. Um, but there's also with tamoxifen, small risk uterine cancer if you're postmenopausal, small risk of blood clot. Um, aromatase inhibitors, I see more joint aches and pains um, and risk of bone thinning because estrogen helps keep your bones thick. And in the case of aromatase, never thin. Okay, I'm going to move if that's okay. Move on. Is that okay?
Okay. All right. So then that's enough. So let's talk about HER2, which is the other specific exciting part about breast cancer. Um, let me see. So in HER2 positive disease, the most a very exciting um, development recently is, is a drug called Herceptin. And Herceptin is an antibody um, that sits on the HER2 receptor, which is overexpressed in some forms of breast cancer, and it prevents the HER2 receptor from doing what it's supposed to do in order to allow cells to divide and proliferate. Again, first approved in the metastatic setting and then in combination with chemotherapy in 2006. Um, the way the, the length of therapy, remember, for uh, tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors, five years. For this particular therapy, you give it for one year, so difference there. Um, this, um, oh, and I'm sorry, I wanted to say one other thing. So Herceptin, um, probably more complex than just blocking that HER2 receptor. Probably this antibody that we're giving um, causes a decrease in blood flow to tumor cells and may also cause the immune system to recognize the tumor cells. The truth of the matter is that we're not 100% sure exactly how it works, but we know that this is one of the mechanisms. Um, Okay, this was um, one, a, a trial called the B31 trial, which just demonstrated um, that in the adjuvant setting, again, after, the, uh, after your breast cancer has been resected, um, then um, on the, on the y-axis, patients were free of recurrent disease, and on the x-axis, years after randomization. So people who got one year of Herceptin um, did very well. 90% um, of patients didn't have a recurrence at four years, and the people who uh, didn't get Herceptin, 74% were free. So you got those, that, that difference in those curves there is very significant for a medical oncologist. And we have data going even longer than that, um, but, but this particular size for, for four years. So this was a huge discovery. Um, the other, um, and it, you know, that was exciting. And then even more recently, in the last five years, we have a new antibody that's called Pergetta, um, and or pertuzumab. And you can see um, Herceptin or Trastuzumab there on the HER2 receptor. Pertuzumab, the way it works, is to bind on a different site at HER2, and it also prevents it from doing what it's supposed to do for the cell to replicate. It prevents it from binding to these other HER1, 3, and 4, the other HER family proteins, and probably also has a role in, um, in blood supply to the tumor cell and maybe also in the immune response um, in terms of attacking uh, the cancer from that way. So um, two antibodies now we can give for the HER2 positive. Um, aspect. Our data in the adjuvant setting for Progetta is, uh, is okay. It's evolving. We have great data for Progetta in the metastatic setting. It's approved in the adjuvant setting, and I give it to most all my patients in the adjuvant setting, um, depending on tumor size. But this trial was called the Cleopatra trial um, and was published in 2012, and it showed in the metastatic setting, if you give uh, pertuzumab or pergetta plus Herceptin versus Herceptin alone, you get about a six-month disease-free survival benefit. Again, that's huge in the metastatic setting to keep cancer away for six additional months. That's, um, I think what I wanted to say about that. Okay. So um, at the end of my um, timeline, I alluded to other medicines that have been approved. This, these are in the metastatic setting, too, for now. Uh, palbociclib, or Ibrantz, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's another medicine that's now approved for estrogen receptor positive. It's a CDK4-6 inhibitor, which just means that it, pre it uh, prevents cells from uh, going through their cell cycle and dividing. What we found in trials is that it works together with that, uh, those aromatase inhibitors very well in metastatic setting to keep, uh, to keep um, breast cancer under control. The other um, medicine which is very attractive sounding and works very well is called TDM1, which is, we've been using for the past three and a half years. Um, and this is also called a chemo bomb or smart drug. Um, it takes a medicine like that Herceptin, attaches chemo to it, and then the, the antibody can go and find that HER2 receptor and see this has 
this is chemo attached to it, and deliver, deliver chemotherapy specifically into cancer cells. So um, that's also in the metastatic setting for HER2 positive disease. Now, I talked about all about the ERPR and HER2, um, but if you have triple negative breast cancer, you don't have any of that, and this is what's treated with our traditional chemotherapies. Um, and, and for metastatic, or for breast cancer, which is triple negative, um, one of the things which is interesting to me is immunotherapy. Um, this pembrolizumab, and again, this is all in clinical trials. We don't use immunotherapy outside a clinical trial for triple negative breast cancer yet, but one of the interesting areas. Um, it was, it's approved already for melanoma and lung cancer. You've probably seen ads, heard it's big on the news. Um, and then there's, there are trials in metastatic triple negative using this agent. And the way that immunotherapy works is that um, it enables your immune system um, to recognize breast cancer cells, replicate itself, and become specific to fight those breast cancers. So in a way, it's enabling your own immune system to um, to attack cancer cells. And there are on switches and off switches in the immune system. And the way this specifically works is to turn off the off. So the immune um, system doesn't have any inhibition to it and can recognize and kill uh, cancer cells without, without any inhibition. That's how it works. I think that was, that was all I had to say about that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the surgical treatment of breast cancer and some of the, you know, more recent developments in cancer. And just like Stacy talked about some of the ways in which we're trying to deliver more targeted therapy to patients and more individualized treatment, looking as opposed to 20 years ago where we looked at the size of the tumor and if lymph nodes were involved, Today, we want to look at more specific features of your cancer to determine, do you really need to have this treatment? And we've developed better ways at identifying that and better tests to find the specific targets. With surgery, we're looking to do less surgery as well. And it's really thought by a lot of breast surgeons that eventually we're gonna put ourselves out of business because all of these targeted therapies that are gonna be developed are gonna be what treats breast cancer and we're not gonna to need to approach breast cancer surgically anymore in the future. And some people think that it will happen during you know, my career that we will progress to having these therapies in that we will only be doing surgery for breast cancer to salvage people who don't respond to the antibody therapies and the more targeted therapies that Stacy has to give people. And, you know, it's a job that I would be happy to lose if we make such great developments. So I'm first going to start with a little bit of a historical perspective of how we treated breast cancer because just as we're going to try and use surgery less and less, surgery was originally the only means we had to treat breast cancer. And from, um, for a very long time, surgery and more extensive surgeries were what we used. How, the Halstead radical mastectomy was the standard of care for breast cancer from 1894 until the late 1960s. And what this encompassed was not only removing the breast itself, but removing a lot more of the surrounding tissues. And when we were doing this, patients went to sleep knowing they had a lump in their breast because it was before we did mammograms, really. And they didn't know if they would wake up with a breast or not. Um, and it was a very life-changing surgery for these women. So this is just a pictorial example of what the incisions were like. And as opposed to more modern day surgeries where we're able to close the incisions in most patients, they did very wide excision of not only the breast, but the overlying skin, the underlying muscle down to the ribs, and very extensive lymph node surgery um, when we were doing this. And the area where the skin was removed generally had to be skin grafted to close the wound. So up until the 1960s, 
we had the Halstead radical mastectomy, and that really did last up until the 70s. But in the, sometime in the 1960s, um, we had found that maybe not more extensive surgery isn't the better answer. At some point when we weren't curing cancers with the Halstead mastectomy, they did something called the extended radical mastectomy, where not only you remove the lymph nodes underneath the arm, but we opened the breastplate and removed the lymph nodes underneath the sternum, thinking that if we remove more lymph nodes, we might do a better job. And not only did we not do a better job, we did a worse job in curing breast cancer when they did that. And so that led to the idea that maybe we could do a little less surgery. And they did the modified radical mastectomy where although they took a lot of skin, they didn't take enough that skin grafts needed to be done unless the tumor was that extensive. And they did not remove muscle, although they did transect it. Um, over that period, we then got away from transecting the muscle as well, and we would do a simple mastectomy, just removing the breast and the overlying skin, um, and lymph node surgery as appropriate with an axillary node dissection. But again, not removing as many nodes as we used to, and I'll explain what an axillary node dissection is a little later. Um, in 2010, there was a study that was done um, at MD Anderson in Texas, and they looked at 1,810 patients comparing the um, skin sparing mastectomy, which people started to look at in the 1990s, to a simple mastectomy. And what they found was that there was no difference in recurrence risk between those two surgeries. And so that brings us to more of the present day approach to most breast cancers where we, we are able to save a large portion of the skin in the breast in selected patients and that we can more individually look at the tumor where it's located if we are doing a mastectomy what skin we have to remove so that we can get margins around the tumor for the cosmetic finding results of the surgery that we're doing. Um, and it allowed us to better able to reconstruct the breast at the time of the initial mastectomy in many patients. So this is a patient who had a skin sparing mastectomy and nipple reconstruction, and eventually she had nipple tattooing. Um, and while we removed a little bit of the excess skin because she wanted somewhat of a reduction, you can see that once her scars fully heal and she has her tattoos done, um, the appearance as opposed to the concave area of the chest with the extensive scarring and skin grafts is something that is a huge change and move forward for women. Nipple sparing mastectomy was the next extension of this. As you can see in these patients, they end up with a scar, but except for the fact that this patient wanted to be a little bit larger, you know, she has scars on her breast, she's retained her nipples, she does not have sensation, but again, it's another step in forward in what the cosmetic outcome from mastectomy can be. So again, with nipple sparing mastectomy, we're removing the breast tissue, provide, preserving the entire skin envelope, the nipple, the nipple in the realer complex around it, and it's one of the more, most recent advances that we've made in breast surgery. When I was um, training during my fellowship in 2001, a patient came in requesting a nipple sparing mastectomy. And it was only shortly after some of the early studies were looked at the feasibility. And, um, you know, my mentor at the time, who is now the head of Sloan Kettering's program, told the patient that she wouldn't do that surgery because there's no reason for her to do a mastectomy for her and leave the nipple behind, leaving her that such a high risk of still having a problem and that it was not an ethical surgery to do. 
Um, so it was a huge change in a very short period of time because by about 2005, 2006, this was becoming a much more common approach. And over the last five to 10 years, it's really you know, had a lot of data behind it to show that it is in selected patients a safe surgery to do. And part of this was uh, the force to do this was that we learned more and more about one, genetic mutations and risk, and patients were trying to move forward with preventative surgeries. And second, we were identifying cancers much earlier. And so with smaller cancers in patients who were having mastectomies, we wanted to be able to move forward, giving them better results. Um, the most recent study that has been done looking at nipple sparing mastectomies was a review of all of the literature. Um, and it, they specifically look at eight studies comparing nipple sparing mastectomy to skin sparing mastectomies and modified radical mastectomies. So preserving the skin but not the nipple or real or complex and not really preserving much skin at all compared to compar saving the whole envelope, and they showed n no difference in local recurrence between the surgeries or no statistically significant difference. And so again, why are we looking at this now? We have an improved screening. Um, the patient population of patients who want prophylactic mastectomy due to higher risk of developing cancer. And a lot of women are choosing mastectomy now due to reasons that we don't really completely understand, as opposed to in the past, people really wanted to conserve their breasts. A lot of times women are choosing mastectomy even though they are good lumpectomy candidates or breast conservation candidates. Um, and part of the ability to do that is we're able, able to give better cosmetic results with improvements in breast reconstruction as well as less extensive breast surgery and removal of the skin. So when we look at patients who are the candidates for nipple sparing mastectomy, you know, obviously we have to see no evidence of nipple involvement on physical exam or imaging studies. And when you look at different people in different series, people will allow different criteria from surgeon to surgeon. But when you look at all the studies that were done, there was a five to 23% risk of occult nipple involvement. And when you really get down to the more recent studies looking at the selected populations, it, there was about a 2% incidence of cancers developing in the nipple subsequently in the next five to 10 years. Um, so some of the things we want to avoid are tumors behind the nipple or real or complex or within two centimeters. Higher grade cancers have a little higher risk. Having more than three lymph nodes involved with cancer increases the risk of nipple involvement. Having what we call lymphovascular invasion so that the lymphatic vessels within the breast tissue or underneath the skin of the breast, if we see cancer cells within those, then the risk of the nipple having occult tumor cells that we didn't identify on imaging studies, or having multiple tumors within the same breast, all are factors that could increase risk. There are also patient factors, um, looking at body habitus and breast size, the amount of ptosis or gravity effect as we get older to our breast that somebody has, depending on the type of reconstruction that somebody's going to have, um, you may or may not be able to preserve the nipple or real or complex as easily. The more ptosis you have, the more difficult that becomes. And the larger the breast is, the risk of that becomes a little bigger because 
you have more skin and the way that the blood supply supplies that island of skin, once you remove the breast tissue from underneath it, the longer those flaps are, the more difficult it becomes. Somebody who has had prior radiation can have an increased risk of healing issues when you do do nipple sparing mastectomies or loss of the nipple. Other issues like smoking, nobody, you know, it would be very rare for some a plastic surgeon to agree to do a nipple sparing mastectomy on somebody who smokes because the risk of losing the nipple is too high and it causes complications and increased risk of infection and even loss of an implant or other considerations. We also want to look at the overall health of the patients. It is a, a more difficult operation to do because of the small incisions that we use. It's a, it takes a lot more time to do this operation than if you are not sparing the nipple. Just removing the nipple or real or complex compared to removing, leaving it behind adds a fairly, you know, from a surgical standpoint, a good amount of time to the surgery. Um, but it does give a projection to the breast and a natural look to the breast that you cannot really capture in any other way. So some of those um, complications and some of the reasons we avoid that due to patient factors are the skin flap ischemia or skin death that can um, happen when we're sparing more skin than just enough to close an incision. So we're talking about um, mastectomy there, but you know, it was felt to be a huge advance in the care of breast cancer in um, 1985 when this study came out in the New England Journal of Medicine showing that the five-year survival and uh, for patients having breast conservation or lumpectomy is the same as someone undergoing a mastectomy. Um, and so this trial that came out in 1985 was a huge advancement for breast conservation and the use of breast conservation in the United States. They had previously had study results in England and Europe coming out and um, lumpectomy was um, embraced there much sooner than it was here. It wasn't until this trial came out that a lot of people did embrace that. And so, what we know now is 25 year survival of patients who were in this clinical trial who had breast conservation compared to patients who underwent mastectomy was the same. So why are so many people choosing mastectomy when we have such long term data that shows that it doesn't matter what surgery you choose, as long as we effectively treat your cancer and remove it, survival's gonna be the same. And, you know, again, it's a perplexing question. A lot of times it is fear. Um, patients will say, well, I know somebody who had a lumpectomy and their breast cancer came back. And so they're influenced by an individual person. They're so anxious when they're diagnosed that they can't imagine ever calming down about their risk of getting a new cancer and sleeping at night in the future if they do that. But the reality is, is that for the average patient, the risk of developing a second cancer in the other breast is relatively small, especially with all of the treatments that we're giving today with hormonal therapy that not only reduces your risk of cancer recurring elsewhere in your body and in the treated breast, but also reduces your risk of developing a cancer in the other breast. So that medicine they're giving you to help prevent cancer from coming back elsewhere also helps prevent you from getting that second cancer. And sometimes in the past, you know, patients weren't felt to be good candidates for breast conservation. Um, the amount of tissue that we would have to remove compared to the size of the breast might be a little out of sync with what we have to do. However, once again, we're finding smaller and small, smaller cancers now that we are doing more imaging 
of patients and patients are going for annual imaging um, with the advent of 3D mammography. Um, we increased our pickup of smaller and smaller cancers to the point that some people think that we're doing too much imaging and we should do less because we're picking up cancers that aren't significant. The other thing that has come into being over the last 20 years or so is something that we call oncoplastic surgery. And the initial people doing this were out of England because they really didn't have the resources of reconstructive surgery and their plastic surgeons weren't available to help them. And so if they had a surgery that they had to do that where they had to do more surgery, the breast surgeons were trained to do things like breast reductions while they were doing the lumpectomy or breast lifts and then reductions on the other side for symmetry. And so a lot of times we will in the United States work, work with plastic surgeons if a tumor is going to change a little bit of the size of your breast or if you have a larger breast and had been considering a breast reduction, we can combine the surgeries into something we call an oncoplastic approach to the cancer, removing the cancer and um, allowing you to have that better cosmetic outcome from it. So the last thing I want to talk about is the surgical treatment of the lymph nodes. And I think that this is probably of everything we've done, the best improvement we've made for women and their quality of life related to breast surgery. Um, because we have known for a long time um, that treatment of the nodes with surgery possibly doesn't affect survival from breast cancer. And in fact, it's possibly just a staging procedure and that only in patients who have cancer cells in lymph nodes are we really helping them at all by removing the lymph nodes. If we're removing a normal healthy lymph node, we're putting them at risk of lots of side effects and complications of nodal surgery without them giving them any benefit. And while there is some information we need to gather from looking at the lymph nodes in terms of determination of treatment, as we are getting better at genetically categorizing our cancers, that's becoming less and less important in a portion of the surgery that we might not do anymore sooner rather than later. And in fact, we're doing a lot less axillary nodal surgery than we used to, and there are studies going on every day looking at ways that we can avoid doing that. And so the first um, studies that were done to find a way to avoid doing an axillary node dissection or removal of the lymph nodes and the fat in a defined anatomic region under the arm, which included 10 to 20 lymph nodes, was a study that looked at a biopsy of a sentinel node in melanoma. And what was done is um, they were able to identify how the area where a melanoma drains and what nodes that the melanoma drain to and then identify and target those nodes and just check those nodes. And so somebody who, Armando Giuliano, who was um, a breast surgeon primarily but also worked with melanoma said, well, if we can do this for melanoma, why can't I do this in breast? And with all of the swelling of the arm or lymphedema he saw from the extensive nodal dissections, he applied that and did some of the first studies to show that it was feasible to identify the draining patterns of the breast to the lymph nodes by doing this. And this is just a picture of a lymph node that had been removed and um, somehow I deleted the other slide or moved it, but um, you can inject a radionucleotide substance around an area of cancer around the nipple or realer complex and a blue dye, or you can also use one or the other. And by watching the drainage patterns of these, you can find the lymph nodes that are most likely to have cancer cells and remove those. And on average, there are two or three lymph nodes as opposed to the 10 or 20 we needed to, to check to find out if the lymph nodes were 
evolved before this was developed. And so one, once we showed that we can do a sentinel node biopsy, people were doing that and doing axillary node dissections still. And so there were a couple of trials looking at can we eliminate the axillary node dissection and leave the lymph nodes alone? And it was shown that the first studies showed that, yes, we can do sentinel node biopsy, and if there are no cancer cells within the lymph nodes, there's no benefit of going back and removing those 10 to 20 lymph nodes that we used to. And then from there, additional studies, this Z11 study was done and showed that not only can we leave the lymph nodes alone if there are no cancer cells in the sentinel nodes, but if you have up to th two lymph nodes involved with cancer and it's not um, bulky disease, we can probably leave the rest of the lymph nodes alone anyway if somebody is having a lumpectomy or breast conservation. Um, and that's one of the caveats and one of the reasons why it surprises me sometimes when people choose mastectomy because sometimes they come in with the preconceived notion that that would be a better choice for them. But when you explain to them that they lose some of their choice in treatment of the lymph nodes if the lymph nodes are involved in other portions of the surgery that can be life altering, they sometimes change their opinion. And what we found is that the axillary recurrence risk at six years after doing a sentinel node biopsy is 0.2%, which is not statistically significantly different than patients having axillary node dissections. And that's based on missing, in most patients, missing a node that is involved. And so the current guidelines for treatment of the lymph nodes is that women should have a sentinel lymph node biopsy and not an axillary node dissection without obvious lymph node involvement clinically. Um, women with one to two metastatic sentinel lymph nodes who are having breast conservation and radiation do not need axillary node dissections in most cases, although patients should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Women with lymph nodes that are positive at sentinel lymph node biopsy and a mastectomy should undergo axillary node dissection, although many surgeons are avoiding that. And women with multicentric tumors, meaning tumors in more than one location, ductal carcinoma in situ, and, cite and pr a previous axillary node dissection who we did not offer sentinel node to in the past, can be offered this safely. And so this is just um, the rates of sentinel lymph node biopsy alone without a completion axillary node dissection over time. So 1998 to 2005, and it shows with the Yellow line is the people with nodal metastasis over two millimeters, and then the blue dashed line is nodal metastases that are um, 0.2 to two millimeters, or what we call micrometastases. And you see that with those micrometastases, more and more over time, we're leaving the lymph nodes alone. And as of 2010, when the Z11 study came out, that became even more prominent for us to leave people, even with macroscopic disease, alone. Um, this is just talking about some of the side effects of doing an axillary node dissection and sentinel node biopsy. So sentinel node biopsy has a lot less risk of side effects, but it is not zero, although a lot of times some of the findings in the side effects of the surgery are more transient. Um, so the patients who have problems with moving their arm in range of motion of their arm with axillary node dissection, it's 19% versus sentinel node, 13%. Um, the arm volume difference or lymphedema, 
28% versus 17%, although when we look at lymphedema rates in patients with sentinel node through all the trials, the mean percentage of patients who have some swelling, which is by no means as much as people have with axillary node dissection, is about 7%. Um, arm numbness due to transection of a nerve called the intercostobrachial nerve that supplies this part, which can lead to tingling, is seen in 31% of patients with an axillary node dissection versus 8%. Um, um, and the tingling part is 7% versus 13%. Um, in the past, it's been very controversial whether or not sentinel node biopsies can be done in patients getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy or chemotherapy prior to surgery. We still frequently will have conversations of whether or not the patient needs an extra surgery to check the lymph nodes prior to chemotherapy and then to go back and do their breast surgery later. Um, most, the most frequent advocates of this are the radiation therapists today, um, although there are now many um, studies that have shown that as long as the tumor is under seven centimeters, the sentinel node biopsy is very accurate after chemotherapy. And if you carefully evaluate the lymph nodes with ultrasound prior to surgery, there's not, you, and there's no evidence of nodal involvement, there's not a real reason to proceed with any pre-neoadjuvant chemotherapy surgery. Um, and so the last thing that I'm gonna talk about and mention briefly is what do we do about patients who we know have lymph nodes involved prior to getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy? We give them that therapy, which is more and more giving people what we call a complete pathologic result. So there's no evidence of cancer left at all within the breast after treatment, especially with the new combination that Stacy talked about with the Herceptin and Pertuzumab. We're having a lot of success with chemotherapy. So does the fact that somebody had evidence of lymph node involvement prior to that treatment, and we see no evidence of it left later, mean that we can't do a sentinel node and they need an axillary node dissection? And in the past, the answer was yes, they definitely need an axillary node dissection. But what we have seen for some, from some recent small studies, and these are three of them, one from the US, one from Europe, and one from Canada, and some current ongoing studies that are where people are being enrolled now, is that if there are one to two lymph nodes involved, you do appropriate imaging, you identify the nodes, you biopsy the nodes and put a clip in just like we do when we do breast biopsies with the needle. And then when we go back and we do the sentinel node biopsy, we don't just do the same thing we did in patients having primary surgery. We do what we call targeted axillary node dissection, meaning we do a sentinel node biopsy and we localized the nodes that we knew had cancer in them prior to surgery with a wire so that we are sure we get those out. If all of those nodes have no evidence of cancer, we don't need to do the axillary dissection. Um, there are some technical differences in the way we have to perform these. We need to make sure we remove those nodes that we knew were positive and check them, which is why the clip has to be placed. If there's no clip, we can't be sure we get that lymph node out, so then you have to do an axillary node dissection. Um, and when they look at the false negative rate in the three studies that were done, um, it was about 12.6 to 14 percent, meaning in all of these trials did different, had different ways of looking at it, not all of which included the things that I just described. And so when the studies were done that looked at the procedure that I just described, 
the small data set showed a false negative rate that was under 5%, which is close to the same as that for patients who have not had chemotherapy and didn't have previously positive nodes and an acceptable level. So 4.2% was the, the most recent study that was just published looking at that method. So that, those just talk about those studies. So these are the ongoing trials looking at that, that, that. And what the um, guidelines say is that we should not necessarily be doing this in all comers right now. We should try and enroll patients who have positive notes prior to chemotherapy that's given prior to surgery in clinical trials so that we can be sure that in all the studies before were single, single institutions and we want to make sure that this is able to be done over many places with different surgeons, with different protocols. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um,